today I'm very um, happy to uh, have Federica Guccini join us to talk about uh, her research about Hakka. Federica Guccini is a PhD uh, candidate in anthropology uh, in, uh, at Western University. And uh, her research focused on Hakka Mauritian migration language identity practice in Mar Mauritius and Canada. And his research, uh, her research is supported by Vanier Scholarship, very prestigious uh, uh, doctoral scholarship from Canada, very competitive. And uh, over to you, uh, Federica. Thank you so much for the really nice introduction. I actually feel very honored to have been invited to be part of this speaker series and to be given the opportunity to present my research on Hakka identity negotiation, multicultural Mauritius. And I've also already seen in the participant uh, list for the attendees today that there's lots of people from Mauritius uh, in the audience. So that makes me very happy. Um, I'm currently writing my dissertation. So I just want to preface my presentation today by saying that this is somewhat unfinished work uh, that I'm still actively thinking about and writing up. Um, but at the same time, that gives me a chance to receive early feedback for my next dissertation chapter on this topic. So I'm really excited uh, to engage with questions and comments at the end of the talk. Um, okay, so on this title slide, I have included a picture um, that I took of the 2020 parade for the Lunar New Year in Chinatown in Mauritius. On the picture, you see a crowd of people waving uh, Mauritian and Chinese national flags. Um, walking towards one of the Chinatown gates, um, which mark the area of Chinatown, um, which covers a few, blo a few blocks in uh, the capital of Mauritius, Port Louis. And on the left um, of the picture here, you also see Juma Mosque, uh, which is located right next to the Chinatown gate. And to me, that's kind of emblematic of this close coexistence of various ethnic and religious communities um, in Mauritius. So just to give you a brief overview, um, let me just get my notes here. Zoom is kind of overlaying here. Okay, so to uh, give you a brief overview of this paper, I'm going to give you um, a brief overview of my um, project and fieldwork and then explain the ethnographic context of my research a bit more. Um, I'll then outline the broad, broad strokes of identity theory and anthropology and the social sciences, and then I'm going to speak in more detail about my findings on Chinese and specifically Hakka identity negotiation in Mauritius. Um, before concluding with a few key observations. So um, starting with my project overview, my dissertation is situated in the fields of sociocultural and linguistic anthropology. And through this lens, I study the intersections of um, migration, identity, and language practices in the Hakka Mauritian community in Mauritius and Canada, but not for this presentation today. Um, some key themes I explore in my thesis include local heritage language shifts from Hakka and Cantonese to Mandarin, as well as the role of Chinatown as a window into the challenges uh, that Sino Mauritians face. Today, I focus on the chapter that I'm currently writing, Hakka Identity Negotiation and Multicultural in Multicultural and Multilingual Social Spaces in Mauritius. It's a bit of a mouthful. <laughs> Um, in my thesis, I argue that Mauritius provides an environment that is particularly conducive to both fluid and rigid identification and disidentification processes. As my context reported different levels of feeling or being Hakka that depended on Mauritian and other local and global factors. So in my chapter, I discuss the roles of plurilingualism and language ideologies, uh, language ideologies in these processes as well. Um, and I'm happy to take questions about that, but in this presentation, I'm more concerned with the multicultural aspects of Mauritian society. So let us take a closer look at Mauritius for those of you who haven't been there. Um, so at the top here, you see an interactive Google map that shows the southern part of Africa and the Indian Ocean. And Mauritius being a small island state is barely visible on this map. Um, so I'll zoom in a bit closer. If that works, yeah, there we go. Um, so Mauritius is located about 800 kilometers east of Madagascar and forms part of the Mascarene Islands. And there they go. Uh, that, those are the Mascarene Islands. So that, that includes the island of Mauritius. Um, I hope you can see the cursor when I move this. Um, and then the island of Rodrik, which um, forms part of the Republic of Mauritius, but uh, has autonomous status. And then we have La Réunion, which is um, to this day a French overseas department. So zooming in a bit closer to Mauritius. Ooh, <laughs> there we go. 
um, we see the most densely populated um, strip of the island with the, from the city's Kyrpip to the capital um, at the coast, Polui. And um, the picture below shows you kind of this part of the island. So we're looking at the harbor of Polui and um, the city here. Um, so this picture was taken uh, during a hike on the adjacent mountain range. And so you can see lush green mountains, um, blue skies, and um, the coastline stretching up into the north. So this was where I did my field work. And of course, I didn't have this view every day, <laughs> I wish. Uh, but I just wanted to show you what, um, yeah, what the island looks like for those of you who haven't been there. Okay, so continuing um, with data collection. My first visit to Mauritius was for a pilot study in June and July of 2018. Um, and in the following year, I spent roughly 10 months in Mauritius for a longer field work period. Apart from research in Mauritius, I also wanted to engage in some multi-sided fieldwork to honor the many migration trajectories of my research participants. Um, I was able to go on a short excursion to the Fuzian Tulo, um, which are Hakka roundhouses, and I'll get back to those briefly later, uh, in China. And then I attended the New York Hakka conference in New York City and went on two um, roughly week-long research trips to the other Masquerine Islands, which I just showed, Rodrigue and La Réunion, in 2019 and 2020, respectively. Um, the additional field work that I had planned to do with Hakka Mauritians in Canada, which is one of the most popular um, immigration destinations for Hakka Mauritians, um, this was planned for post-March 2020, so you can probably guess that the pandemic um, put a bit of a dent in that, and I had to uh, collect the rest of my data virtually, which means that it's unfortunately going to be a bit less prominent in my study, but I still had um, some opportunities to do interviews and visit the Toronto Hakka Conference virtually on Zoom um, in 2021. Um, methodolog uh, methodologically, I engaged in classic ethnographic participant observation in which the researcher both observes and becomes part of everyday practices. So I was a participant observer for many events, for example, in weekly activities such as Mandarin classes and line dancing classes, and also in community gatherings um, and performances and festivities. Um, I also conducted 32 semi-structured interviews with mainly Hakka Mauritians, also some Cantonese and some uh, who were not necessarily Hakka Mauritians, but Hakka Rodrigans or Hakka Reunione. Um, and two of my interviews were walking interviews in which the informant would show me around Chinatown as part of the interview. So in the picture here um, on the slide, you can see a retired journalist Roland Sang Kwai Kyu on one of those walking interviews um, in February, February 2020. And Roland, I should mention, um, was my first contact in Mauritius and really graciously helped me with setting up my research. So he actually introduced me to what feels like half the island. Um, so that's how I got started with my research. And here you see him looking at the camera, wearing a microphone on his shirt as he's speaking to me. And behind him in the distance uh, here, you can see the same Chinatown gate that I showed earlier. Um, a part of uh, apart from these interviews that I conducted, I also distributed an online survey, which returned about 93 responses from Hakka Mauritians in different countries. Um, so not just Hakka Mauritians or Hakka Mauritian Canadians, but also people um, residing in other locations. Um, and the last two aspects of my methodology here that I listed are linguistic landscape photography and videography, as well as archival records. And those are not going to be quite relevant to the talk that I'm giving today, but um, I wanted to include them because they will be part of my other dissertation uh, research. Um, I would also be remiss not to mention the vast number of sources that were authored by Sino Mauritian researchers and writers. So the pictures that I've included here on the slide shows the covers of a few important nonfiction books. And sadly, I won't have the time to get into all of them in detail. Uh, but I just wanted to mention them because a lot of these sources were very valuable to me um, to understand the historical context of Mauritian um, Immigrant, Chinese immigration to Mauritius. Um, and so some of these authors are Clément Chan, Edouard Limfat, uh, Huguet Li Tiofan uh, Pineo, James Ning Fung Kwang, Pascal Siu, Roland Tsang Kwai Kyu, and Joseph Tsang Manghin. Okay. Um, so getting into the ethnographic context of the histories now. Um, a very important site of migration history in Mauritius is the former immigration depot and now UNESCO heritage site, Aplavasigat. Um, so I took this photo inside the Aplavasigat Museum, and this picture shows a miniature model of the depot building and a ship in its harbor. 
So Mauritius migration history is a stepping stone, not only towards um, today's multicultural society in Mauritius, but also to Mauritian population in and of itself, because the island was uninhabited prior to its colonization by the Dutch um, in the 17th century, the French in the 18th century, and then the British from 1810 to 1968. Uh, the initial population was based solely on colonial settlements, slavery, and later indentured labor. The enslaved population came from West and East Africa, many from Madagascar, and huge numbers of indentured laborers came from, main, uh, from various parts of India, and then some also from China. Um, and the, um, the Chinese uh, early indentured laborers were then followed later in the late 19th and early 20th century by a wave of free Chinese merchants and craftspeople. All right. So due to Mauritian's ancestral origins in other parts of the world, Mauritius is often described as a rainbow nation. Um, today's population is most often cited as being 52% Hindus, 29% general population, 16% Muslims, and 3% Sino Mauritians. And I should mention this is um, outdated census data from the 1980s. Um, so most Sino Mauritian community members estimate actually that their community is now closer to about 1% or even less. Um, because many have emigrated to other places such as Canada and Australia. Um, but it's really hard to verify this estimation or give co like complete or accurate numbers um, because the ethnic um, community category has been banned from the census and so new data is not available. Um, but still most Mauritians, um, even though this has been banned, most Mauritians position themselves as belonging to one of these four major categories. Um, so we've got the somewhat confusingly named category general population, which encompasses white Franco Mauritians and Creole Mauritians, whose ancestors were enslaved. And then we've got Indo Mauritians who are further um, divided into religious communities, Hindus and Muslims. And even though the uh, general population and Sino Mauritians are mostly Catholic, they are not represented in terms of religious belonging, but in terms of this more um, uh, ethnic um, divide. So, so we've got um, a bit of a mix of ethnic and religious co um, community boundaries there. And you can also see um, these four groups represented on a wallet that I saw at a senior Mauritian souvenir shop in Mauritius. So this wallet here shows a, a, the Mauritian national flag and the map of Mauritius. And on top of that, you can see um, four people um, whose clothing and appearance indicate that they belong to the Muslim, Indian, Creole, and Chinese community. And so these ethno-religious and ethno-national and racial categorizations are actually frequently still invoked in, uh, and reinforced in Russian society, for example, in terms of political representation, social practices, and stereotypes. Um, you may also note the, the writing. Um, on the wallet here, which reads Mauritius, the world in miniature, which kind of hints at local discourses of multiculturalism and diversity. And I will get back to the implications that that has for local Hakka identity later. Okay, so this is where I need to connect some histories. Uh, so I'm not a historian, but I find the concept of connected histories um, really helpful. Um, it's, it was coined by Sanjay Subramanyam, and um, he says it helps us understand that, um, I quote, nationalism has blinded us to the possibility of connection. So connected histories or the related concepts, entangled histories and histoire croisée um, create complex narrative webs in which local history is not seen as separate but as interconnected with other local and global histories. So this approach highlights how racial, ethnic, national and linguistic categories change over time and space and depend on the people that construct and use them to navigate their social realities in different places. And while this may be important to consider in any ethnographic research, it certainly is crucial for work that is embedded in multiple diasporic contexts, um, such as this one. And it also fits the often invoked narrative of Hakka people having a tendency for migratory lifestyles, um, considering their historic move from northern to southern Chinese regions. And um, since we're in a Hakka scholar series, you may already know that the word, the word Hakka translates to guest people or guest family, indicating the largely unwelcome Hakka settlement in southern regions um, previously inhabited by Cantonese and Fujianese people. Um, so then Hakka people further emigrated to China after the Taiping Rebellion against the Qing Dynasty was defeated in the uh, 1860s. And so on this map, um, 
uh, on the slide, which was um, uh, a map that was kind of the centerpiece of the Hakka Odyssey exhibition organized by the Toronto Hakka Heritage Alliance in 2019. Uh, here we see not the um, Hakka internal, like the chi China internal migration of the Hakka, um, but more the, the emigration after 1860 to other diasporas. So um, we've got different diasporas represented here, uh, India, Malaysia, Mauritius, Trinidad and Tobago, Jamaica and Canada. And so those are um, those initial emigrations <clears throat> are represented by red arrows. And then we've got further blue arrows, which show the more recent subsequent emigrations from Hakka diasporic communities to Canada. So from Mauritius to Canada and so forth. Um, and then this map also reads in big red letters, Chikanin, which is part of the phrase Hakkanin Chikanin. And I apologize, I do not speak Hakka <laughs> if this is pronounced badly. Um, so that means Hakka people, one of us, or Hakka people, one of the family. Um, and several participants in my research told me that this phrase was something that they felt when they met Hakka people from other countries, um, kind of a sense of immediate connection based on the shared Hakka heritage and history. So this idea of immediate connection is tied to that of identity. And in the next bit, I'll unpack the theoretical concept and, and its application in anthropological work. So um, I took the picture on this slide at an art exhibition at L'Institut Francais in Mauritius. Um, the piece shows a Mauritian Chinese eatery and the sign shows um, Chinese characters um, and the name of the place, Mean Silver Star. Uh, min means Chinese noodles in Creole and Mauritian, the local um, Creole language. And Silver Star likely refers to a Mauritian shipwreck of the same name. And I don't know if this is a real or imagined place. Um, because this was just part of an, an art piece. Um, but there are uh, bowls and bottles on these like bar like tables. And then we see people and cars in the background, a beach scene with palm trees and boats and fish. And then in the foreground at the bar, we see these anamorphic people painted in all black with long ears and snouts and these gangly arms. And um, somehow to me, this um, piece was a nice illustration of this fickle notion of identity because you really cannot see who or even what these creatures are. And because there is the Sino Mauritian context here in this picture as well. So um, of course, identity is a bit more complicated than just a simple who or what. Um, and the term has actually been used with a lot of ambiguity, even in scholarship, ranging from this hard notion of identity is fixed and um, unchangeable to the softer idea that identities are actually rather dynamic and permeable. Um, critics argue that the broadening of the term actually makes it either too much or too little. Um, however, I, to me personally, I think that there is a reason that identity is still such a valuable concept to many people in their social realities. Um, so rather than dismissing the idea altogether, I like to ask what identity does for people, like what does it mean to them, and how does it become salient at different points in their lives. And to be sure, anthropology um, has not always been open to this sort of view. Um, it actually started out as more of an interest in um, the relationship between culture and personality. And the term identity um, was actually first introduced in 1950s psychology as a conceptual improvement of the concept of personality. Um, identity was then used to describe a state of being the same um, or a view of oneself that is identical with the view of others. Um, and social scientists and members of the public started using this term roughly in the in 1960s, and then it gained immense popularity in the following decades. Um, anthropologists over time have broadened the concept from its initial application to define um, communities as homogenous groups with identical traits to now <clears throat> more recently saying that identities are heterogeneous, um, multiple and ever changing. Um, but unfortunately, um, the concept is still often used to shoehorn people into essentialist categories, often with political ramifications. Um, and one way to push back against essentialist identity concept is to frame identity as a process um, or identification. Cultural theorist Stuart Hall um, wrote in his 2000 article, Who Needs Identity, that identification is a process of articulation or a suturing. 
It is, in his view, never a total fit, but more of an approximation. So identity is not super concrete. Um, he also embeds the idea of multiplicity by invoking the logic of more than one. Um, so it's not a singular identity necessarily. Um, most importantly for my talk today, um, Hall says that identification detail uh, entails discursive work, which draws symbolic boundaries between oneself and a constitutive other. So in other words, when we articulate our identities, we position ourselves as something that we are at the same time as something that we are not. And because this process of identification is never completed, we find our positioning constantly shifting. Um, it is through this intersubjective and positional aspect that we can then reformulate identi uh, identity formation as a process of active negotiation and renegotiation. And this view also acknowledges that identity takes continuous work and effort, so to the point that we can think of it as almost a social performance. And here I want to intercept the discussion of identity with some notes from Hakka studies that shine more light on the importance of open ended identification concepts. So we can actually learn quite a bit from Hakka scholars in this regard, because Hakka identity has been discussed in so many different ways in both academic and public forums. Um, so to start with Hakka ethnicity is already somewhat ambiguous. Um, it's most often described as part of or a subgroup of the ethnic Han majority. Um, and Hakka people are, as far as I know, not recognized as an ethnic minority in China. Um, on the other hand, scholars have acknowledged the process of ethnicization or ethnogenesis of Hakka identity due to the conflicts with local Cantonese residents <clears throat> in the areas um, to which Hakka people migrated. Um, so distinct Hakka ethnicity kind of only emerged as a marker of difference from other Southern Chinese groups as soon as they migrated there. Um, and the very name guest people also shows this process of othering that Hakka people have experienced as they were outsiders to the region. Um, in more recent developments in mainland China, Hakka people have also been increasingly exoticized as rural, poor communities with outdated lifestyles. And Hakka scholar Jessica Leo actually calls this a process of disnification in 2015. And interestingly, this, take, uh, this has taken quite the literal turn as of 2020, five years later, uh, the year that the Disney remake of Mulan came out. Um, I will show you the first few seconds of the trailer to illustrate what I mean. I hope this works. We have excellent news. The matchmaker has found you in Australia. So this is already all that I wanted to show you. <laughs> Those of you who are familiar with Hakka studies probably recognize the structure of the building in which Mulan supposedly lives in this live action movie. So these are Hakka Tulo or earth buildings, um, roundhouses with an open yard in the center and several stories of rooms that accommodated large extended families in the wall ring. Um, Mulan being depicted as living in a Tulo makes no sense chronologically or geographically, and the movie makes no specific reference to a Hakka connection. So literally disnified, uh, the filmmakers used Hakka heritage as a prop or backdrop, completely out of context. So I think the point that Leo makes about Hakka disnification is really important to include um, when Hakka culture is essentialized and exotified in this way. Um, but I do also want to stress that this doesn't mean that Hakka identity is any, in any way become fictional or has lost meaning for people. Um, in fact, it actually still seemed to carry a lot of value for many of my research participants. Um, but there is this other tendency of kind of essentializing Hakka culture. There we go. Um, so while this paper actually quite specifically deals with what it means to be Hakka in Mauritius, it seems to also be impossible to discuss notions of distinct Hakkaness without also discussing Chineseness. Um, Hakka making up the majority of the Mauritian Chinese community uh, with the Cantonese minority, these identity formations shift and overlap a bit, um, and at the very least they inform each other. So when many specific Hakka practices are subsiding locally, then other aspects of a broader Chineseness are also increasingly filling the gaps. For example, Mandarin learning um, in the community has um, increased by a lot um, and fewer people speak Hakka. Um, Chineseness, while often invoked as a self-explanatory concept in everyday conversations, has been refined and critiqued by many scholars, and many of the criticisms go toward this notion of a one-size-fits-all homogenized 
um, Chineseness. And as I just said in the previous slide with um, the disnification, we can actually simulate, similarly apply this to an essentialist idea of Hakkanas. So by this point in the paper, I hope it's clear that I'm not interested in the, def uh, in the definition of what exactly Hakkanas is or isn't. Um, but I still want to make sure that I explicitly position myself as a researcher in this work. Um, I'm not Hakka or Chinese or Mauritian. Um, I'm a white European woman from a German Italian family and currently a temporary resident in Canada. So I can relate to some of the experiences of migration language and identity shifts in the Mauritian Chinese community, but there are equally as many, if not more aspects that I don't fully understand. And so um, I'm greatly indebted to everyone who participated in this research and shared their stories and perspectives with me. And I want to acknowledge that before I dive into these many different aspects of Chinese Mauritian and Hakka uh, Mauritian identities, um, because this talk really is only a brief sketch of the much, much more complex realities of being Hakka in Mauritius and in the world. But um, yeah, I want to highlight my participants' voices. Um, so the picture on the slide shows the music and dance performance of the, Lang the legend of Chang'e for um, the 2019 Mid-Autumn Festival at the Sino Mauritian venue Hualien. Uh, it was choreographed and directed by Stefan Asen, a Hakka Mauritian dancer, and the half hour performance incorporated some more generally Chinese, but also specifically Hakka elements. Um, it did, for instance, feature the Hakka language version of the children's lullaby Bright Moonlight or Nyat Kuang Kuang in Hakka, with a specific reference to its significance in Hakka families and the role of grandparents in passing on Hakka tradition to their grandchildren. In 2019, uh, I interviewed Kwang Poon, a Hakka Mauritian man in his 50s in Mauritius. Um, when I asked him what being Hakka meant to him, he explained, I want to, oh, oh, well, sorry. Uh, well, first I have to say that my interest in Hakka um, actually increased over time because I think there comes a time in a person's life when they ask, where do I come from and where am I going? I started to say Hakka, okay, I'm Hakka, but what does it actually mean? And what is a Hakka anyway? So now that I started doing some digging and it appears that the Hakka have a very rich, rich culture and they are very proud of this heritage. So I want to point out the way that Kwang narrated, uh, narrated his newfound interest in the definitions and meanings of being Hakka. Um, he was not the only one of my research participants who indicated that their attachment to and pride in their Hakka background had increased or even started later in life. So this not only indicates a changing and fluent sense of um, identity at different life stages, but also coincides with a resurgent movement of Hakka people around the world, investing time and resources into building transnational networks and communities. So I want to talk a little bit more about that. Um, Hakka scholars have stressed the importance of transnationalism in studying Hakka lived experiences. So Jessica Leo, who I already quoted earlier, um, uses the term global Hakka rather than diasporic or overseas. Um, she identifies transnational and uh, transnational connections and the rise of digital technology as the driving factors of contemporary Hakka interconnection. Um, so actually I had a, a probably outdated number here. According to demographic estimates, there are about 45 to 60 million, but I think uh, Carrie earlier said 100 million, uh, Hakka worldwide. And while concerns about the disappearance of Hakka language and cultural practices are widespread, there's also this palpable resurgence um, of quests for Hakka identity in the diaspora. And we can see this resurgence of Hakka identity in the organization of Hakka conferences around the world. So these conferences, for example, the earlier um, already mentioned World Hakka Conference, which was first held in 1971, um, there's also other um, organized uh, conferences in more local levels, um, such as the New York and Toronto Hakka Conference, um, which are meant to provide a gathering place for Hakka people of various backgrounds and residences to connect and share their experiences and learn more about their heritage from one another. Um, and then also in a meta comment, we can probably also see this Hakka Scholars Network as a way of um, connecting uh, Hakka researchers from around the world. Um, in an anthropological study of Hakka conferences, Joe Ziansin calls them a platform and arena for Hakka ethnic group identification on the local and global level. And moreover, the encounter and interaction with other Hakka people seems to hold a lot of emotional value. So at the conferences that I have attended, which were the New York Hakka conference in 2018 and the virtual Toronto Hakka conference in 2021, 
Um, I noted that the vast amount, a vast amount of people um, expressing feeling validated by the stories that were shared and uh, the presentations that they could relate to. And then many also said that they felt proud to be Hakka or to be part of the Hakka family, which I heard many times in my interviews and other informal conversations as well. So these expressions um, show again, um, quoting Leo, uh, that Hakanas is a quality that has no borders or limits, and it can be claimed, disclaimed, or reclaimed. But then the, the resurgent in, uh, resurgence in Hakka identity movements also needs to be contextualized within a larger, the so-called rise of China. Um, so on this slide, um, I show a picture of a mural in Russian Chinatown by the New Chinatown Foundation. And on the top of the wall, you can see um, a plastic bottle recycling project in the shape of a dragon's torso and scales, um, which is completed by the head here on the mural. And then the rest of the mural shows um, part of uh, the Great Wall of China, uh, blue skies and clouds surrounding the red number 70. Uh, the 70 marks the celebration of the People's Republic of China's uh, 70th anniversary in 2019, which is the year in which the mural was added to the Chinatown landscape. Um, around the world, including Mauritius, China has significantly increased its presence in economic, political, and cultural terms. And we can see this increase of man, uh, like we can see this increase of the presence in Mandarin education programs, Chinese-led summer schools and exchanges and demand for Chinese products um, and investment, as well as the establishment of Chinese government affiliated institutions such as the Confucius Institute or the China Cultural Center. And as a fun fact, the first China Cultural Center around the world was actually established in Mauritius in 1988. Um, at the same time, this rise of China has affected um, not only political and economic relations, but also the way that Chinese people in the diaspora orient and position themselves in relation to China. So yeah, it has also affected the representation of Chinese culture in Mauritius, um, as many of the Chinese government organized events and performances kind of showcase a more homogenized version of Chinese identity um, that doesn't quite capture the diversity of local Hakka and Cantonese communities. So one of my research participants actually described this as Hakka culture being eaten um, by the increasing mainland Chinese presence. Okay, and now more to the to the actual discourses of um, identity um, that I got from Hakka participants. So a somewhat unexpected source for Hakka identity discourse um, was the online survey that I distributed to Hakka Mauritians. Um, the first question on the survey um, was, are you Hakka? And that was initially meant to be nothing more than an inclusion or exclusion criterion for the survey. Um, so I just wanted to make sure that people who actually responded to this were Hakka. Um, however, I designed this question to be open-ended, like with a write-in text box, um, so that people could um, express complexities in their Hakka identity instead of just having to click yes or no. But I hadn't anticipated that the majority of respondents would then provide really elaborate answers as to why and how they identified as Hakka, which was great. Um, that was data that I didn't expect to get. Um, so actually only seven, 17 people gave an affirmative response without providing any justification. And every other respondent, and there were 93 in total, uh, left a few additional words, sometimes even a long paragraph, explaining why and how they felt they were Hakka. Um, so the most common reason for identifying as Hakka um, was uh, stated by 49 respondents, so more than half of the total 93. And this was related to ancestry, lineage, and parentage. Um, so consider this one respondent here saying, my parents are Hakka, so I'm Hakka by descent. And then others would say, my ancestors were Hakka, or um, my grandparents were Hakka, and so forth. 10 people vaguely stated that their origin or cultural background was Hakka, but in some other cases, respondents linked their heritage to a specific place. So five survey participants made reference to China more generally, um, while 16 survey participants specified that their parents or ancestors were from Moyen or Meixian in Guangdong province, where most uh, um, Hakka people in Mauritius come from. So here we have the response, yes, I am the third generation in Mauritius, meaning my paternal grandfather and grandmother are from Moyen, as well as my maternal grandfather. Um, and what I found interesting about this response was that the, 
Hakanes in this response is not only tied to Moyen, but also to Mauritius, indicating the sense of local Hakka Mauritian identity on top of a general sense of Hakka heritage. Uh, ten respondents tied Hakka identity to speaking Hakka, including two participants who felt that they could not fully claim Hakka status due to their lack of Hakka or Chinese competency. So um, the two responses that I juxtapose here are I am Hakka because I speak Hakka versus I am not Hakka because I do not speak it. Um, some respondents also considered Hakka identity to be something you had to practice. Um, so three participants indicated this by saying they followed or maintained um, or preserved Hakka culture, traditions, or customs. Um, so the sample response here reads, uh, yes, my ancestors, ancestors come from Macian, which again shows ties to place, and my family still does maintain the culture when it comes to food and festivities. Um, Hakka food was actually mentioned by quite a few res uh, respondents, um, not just in the survey, but in interviews as well, to be something that inherently connected people to their Hakka heritage. Um, the few responses to the survey in which people expressed ambivalence about the Hakka identity also implied that Hakka identity is somewhat fluid. So um, as the sample response here shows, it's possible to feel both Hakka and not Hakka because the person said yes and no. When I visited Macian district in China, again, test place, um, I felt that I was Hakka and that it was home. However, my attachment to the Hakka culture uh, is not absolute in the sense that I do not feel that I have to keep it at all costs. So this shows um, uh, that the, the place um, that one connects their heritage to might uh, be where one feels most connected to one's hakka but then also a distance from Hakka heritage in the sentiment that you know you don't feel as attached um, to actually actively maintain practices. Um, and then in my interviews, I typically ask people what being Hakka meant to them. And similarly to the survey responses, I just showed this question elicited a range of discursive themes um, around Hakka identity formation and articulation. So these included a sense of belonging or community with other Hakka people, um, which sometimes was accompanied by that phrase I mentioned earlier, Hakka nin chika nin, um, Hakka people, one of us. Um, and then many also mentioned the ability to adapt to new environments due to Hakka migration tendencies, which interviewees often had really catchy idioms for, like um, having the itchy feet of the Hakka, or um, always looking for greener pastures, or being always on the move. Um, and then I also observed and noted in interviews the correlation between Hakka identity and active practices, such as speaking Hakka um, or not speaking Hakka, eating Hakka food, not letting go anything to waste, which is again kind of tied to this migration history of having to preserve everything, um, migrating in general, and then visiting Moyen as well. Um, so yeah, as I mentioned earlier, a sense of Hakka pride was also often present, um, often um, as the result of historical hardships of the Hakka people, intellectual and economic successes of Hakka people, and um, the often cited Hakka qualities, um, resilience and ambition. Um, and then some also expressed the importance of uh, active interest in maintaining Hakka heritage. Um, as part of their answer, which I also thought was really interesting, kind of showing this active approach to um, caring about one's identity. Uh, in a few interviews, generals were also emphasized for, uh, for instance, the absence of feet binding in uh, Hakka populations and then the idea that Hakka women are strong and hardworking. Um, so these expressions um, of a continued Hakka legacy of some sort are part of what N Nicole Constable calls the real or imagined collective history of um, that Hakka people believe that they share. And as I said earlier, it doesn't really quite matter whether those are indeed real or imagined, um, especially since we established that uh, identities are always positional and dependent on context, but rather that the fact that they're invoked in people's narratives at all was really interesting to me because that makes them a social reality of sorts. Um, yeah, and then for others, the social reality was that they did not actually feel particularly Hakka or even Hakka at all, and perhaps unsurprisingly, that was especially expressed among people from younger generations, um, either age-wise or by degree of immigration. Um, however, something that I noticed across the board in my interviews um, 
like all interviewees expressing multiplicities in their identities. So this was particularly important in relation to Mauritius um, cultural and linguistic diversity. So that's um, what I'll go to here. And that is um, almost at the end. <laughs> uh, OK, so um, we've already discussed feelings of hakanas are negotiated and situated in local contexts. Um, so here we'll discuss the local, local context of Mauritianness. Um, in an interview with Charles, uh, a Hakka Mauritian man in his 30s, he stated that he felt like being Mauritian was in and of itself a multiple identity. He said specifically, when everything's mixed up, then you get Mauritian. So being Mauritian is already a mixed identity. Um, and anthropologist Patrick Eisenlohr actually wrote in his book Little India in 2006 that Mauritians typically understand themselves as, I quote, having origins in other parts of the world with continuing commitments to putative ancestral traditions. So unlike national identities that are based on citizens' sameness, Mauritianness is kind of based on this internal difference, um, internal diversity. Um, so on the one hand, this leads to the idea of Mauritius as a cultural mosaic. Um, and on the other hand, it enables the formation and reiteration of subgroups and communal boundaries. Um, this is actually a core debate in the Mauritian nation building process. For example, in 2018, um, which was the year of my pilot study, I encountered um, this poster um, at the airport and on some streets, um, and it shows two joined hands at the top with the Mauritian rainbow flag and the number 50 on top of it. And then in Creole, um, it says, <clears throat> La main. sorry, I'll take some water. There we go. Uh, it says in Creole, la main dans la main, which means hand in hand, uh, which is part of the song that was um, introduced during the independence movements in 1968. Um, and as I also mentioned earlier, Mauritius is often considered a rainbow nation or a model for multicultural states. So we've got this idea of um, inherent diversity and multiculturalism in Mauritius. On the other hand, many Mauritians also bemoan the communalism that is uh, permeating Mauritian society and politics. Um, so this comic strip here on the right um, was included in a book on Mauritius <clears throat> 50th anniversary. Uh, it shows a stroller and three baby bottles of milk, one for the morning, one for noon, and one for the evening. So the first one here reads Nuban, uh, Creole for our group, and the second and third in French read racism and communalism. And this picture kind of indicates that Mauritians are socialized or more metaphorically fed um, with ideas that their ethnic communities are their primary allegiance. So now asking what does this mean for Hakka identity in Mauritius? Well, for one, Hakka identity is entangled in local Mauritian and Hakka cultural uh, and linguistic practices. So certain acts such as speaking Hakka or eating Hakka food are associated with maintaining Hakka heritage. Um, and then learning Mandarin is also increasingly incorporated in this trope. And, um, but Hakka food is also considered to be part of a more classic Mauritian mixed cuisine. So Roland saint Q, who I showed earlier, um, told me in one of our conversations that only as a Mauritian Chinese, he could enjoy Indian roti for breakfast, Hakka noodles for lunch, and Muslim biryani for dinner. Um, and to scrap the Mauritian in front of the Mauritian Chinese or Mauritian Hakka would then not really do his identity justice, like he's both. Um, and uh, if Mauritian Chinese or Hakkanis would not be complete without this localized Mauritian aspect, Hakka identity in Mauritius follows this lo logic of more than one that Stuart Hall invoked in the quote I addressed earlier. Um, so Mauritius as a social environment provides a paradoxical context uh, for Hakka identification and disidentification processes, as we have the idea um, of multicultural harmony and positive associations with cultural heritage on the one hand, and then ethno-communalism and rigid community boundaries hindering this harmonious nation-building process on the other. Um, and in this sense, being Mauritian is a bit of a balancing act and can either support or hinder Hakka ident uh, identification processes. Okay, to recap, uh, Hakka Mauritian identification is many things. Um, it is a constant unfinished process of positioning in various um, social situations, uh, negotiated along the lines of common uh, Hakka tropes and discourses. Um, it's also entangled in global and local cultural and linguistic practices, um, which are then further transformed by this Mauritian discourse that I just mentioned of multicultural harmony versus ethno-communalist boundaries. 
And then I think perhaps most importantly, we can see Hakka Mauritian identification as a critical response to these essentialist tropes of Chinese and Hakka identities, um, which, um, you know, they show us the, the inherent diversity and multiplicity of Hakkaness by including this Mauritian component. Um, all right, so thank you. Um, just on the left here, I've included the references that I mentioned, uh, but didn't put on previous slides. I had some on the slides, but some I didn't. Uh, so here's the ones that I was missing. And I'm happy to share more literature with anyone who's interested. Um, I'd also like to express my gratitude, first and foremost, to the many, many wonderful contributions um, and support that I have received from my research contacts and friends in Mauritius. Again, some of whom are in the audience today. and. Uh, <laughs> Couldn't be happier. <laughs> um, and I wish I could name everyone individually, but we'll be here for a long time if that was the case. Um, then I'd also like to thank my supervisor, Karen Panisi, who I think is also in the audience. Hi, Karen. And acknowledge my funding uh, source, the Vanier Canada Graduate Scholarship. And of course, I want to thank uh, the organizers of the Hakka Scholar Network ser uh, Speaker Series. So thank you. Um, Carrie and uh, Abidin and Alicia and Alex for setting this up for me and letting me share my research. <laughs>